Okay guys, first we're going to talk about what your blood is made up of. So you can see this diagram here from your book. Um, if you take a whole sample of blood, it is subdivided into two sections. Okay, so if we were to spin it out and to get all their separate parts out, you would see that the red portions are very heavy, so it would drop towards the bottom. We get this little middle section called the buffy coat. And we get this little yellowish clear portion towards the top that is plasma, which is mostly water. All right, the first thing you should know is that the red stuff is red blood cells, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But that little buffy coat is made up of two things, which is part of the paper you have to fill in, which is white blood cells and platelets. And then plasma is that watery portion. All right, we're going to spend most of our time here with the formed elements, uh, the platelets, the red blood cells, and the white blood cells. Okay, this is the paper I've given you guys. So you should see here, right on this top left-hand side, you've got the red portion at the bottom, which is red blood cells. You've got the buffy coat, which was made up of two things. So go back and look at what those two things were. And then that yellow, clear, watery portion is towards the top. And what was that called again? So go back to the video and make sure you've got that filled in. So we're going to talk the formed elements, and there's three basic formed elements. And these little green guys here, they look like very, very small particles. Um, they're little individual dots. Those are the platelets. These, of course, are red, so those are our red blood cells. And these are the white blood cells. All right, you're going to see that the white blood cells okay, come in a lot of different forms, which we're going to see on one of the future um, pieces of paper I'll talk about. But let's move down to that plasma, okay, and exactly what's in that plasma. All right, so that plasma is really about somewhere between 92 and 94 percent water. Okay, so you're going to see that is your biggest component. There are some electrolytes that is a conversation for next semester, so things like uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, etc. Uh, there's going to be some waste product, and again, that's part of our discussion next semester. But let's talk about a couple of proteins. All right, so there are three basic proteins that we find. The first is albumins, so A-L-B-U-M-I-N-S. The second is globulins, G-L-O-B-U-L-I-N-S. And the third is fibrinogen, so F-I-B-R-I-N-O-G-E-N. -E and that's the one we're going to come back to um, in one of our future slides. There are also some gases, and two you can probably guess, O2 and CO2, so oxygen and carbon dioxide. The other one is nitrogen. So N2, okay, is the third gas that floats through the bloodstream. Um, the last things you will see are some nutrients, some vitamins, and some hormones. Okay, the first of the formed elements we're going to peek at are your red blood cells. Okay, our abbreviation here, hopefully you know, is RBCs, right? So an RBC is the AKA, also known as. All right, so here you can see we've got a nice little red blood cell. It is described as a biconcave disc, and you should have heard that term once before, meaning that it looks like it dips in a little bit in the center, and it's a little bit thicker towards the outside. All right, there's a number of things that go into making okay, um, a red blood cell. All right, the first is iron. Okay, so iron is one major dietary component. Okay, so this is a guy pumping some iron. We also need vitamin B12, and we need some folic acid, which is another of your B vitamins. Okay, if we're missing one of these components, we will not create a good red blood cell. All right, this little portion here that you see that I'm circling all right, is a little piece called the hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin is a little protein that sits on the outside of your red blood cell, and it carries this little molecule right here, and that little molecule is oxygen. So we need proper hemoglobin okay, on top of your red blood cell in order to carry oxygen. Okay. All right, the biggest thing that goes into that hemoglobin or making up that hemoglobin is the iron and the vitamin B12. All right, so those two are very critical to the formation of the hemoglobin, and without hemoglobin we do not carry any oxygen. All right, a normal red blood cell count for men is about 4,700,000 to about uh, 6,100,000 for every millimeter cubed of blood. And for women, a normal number 
of red blood cells is about 4,200,000 to about 5,400,000 for every millimeter cubed of blood. All right, so you should notice that women's numbers are a little bit less okay, than men's numbers. Um, and this will kind of come into play later as we sort of talk about this. So men sort of naturally have some higher numbers. Red blood cells also live for about 120 days on average. Okay, after that, what we do is we recycle the iron in that hemoglobin to create new red blood cells. Okay, and the rest will be eliminated through primarily the digestive tract. Um, that is a conversation for next semester. Okay, so red blood cells, as are all of your blood cells, are primarily made inside of the bone. So you can see here, I've drawn a picture of the bone and that little hollow cavity down the center, the bone marrow, and in particular the red bone marrow, okay, are, are key for making those red blood cells. All right, in order to make red blood cells, we do need a hormone, okay, and that hormone is called erythropoietin, or EPO for short, and it comes from the kidneys. All right, once the kidneys detect low levels of red blood cells, it will send out erythropoietin. That will go to the bone, and the bone will then increase its creation of red blood cells. However, just keep in mind that it can take about six weeks for new red blood cells to be fully formed. So for treating a patient um, who has low numbers of red blood cells, or anemia could take up to six weeks in order to have the correct numbers. All right, once we are done with our red blood cells, you can see here's one, and I put some X's through it. All right, we take that heme or that iron component, iron com containing component of hemoglobin, and we recycle that. Um, the rest turn into amino acids, okay, but most of this is then eliminated um, either through the digestive tract or it's recycled back into new red blood cells. All right, there are two terms here that you need to define. The first is polycythemia, which refers to having too many red blood cells, and anemia, which is too few red blood cells. Okay, in addition, you should see these little blood cells that I have drawn off to the right-hand side of this page. All right, this is um, your most common genetic type of anemia, which is sickle cell anemia. And sickle cells mean that instead of being like these nice biconcave discs, so this nice little circle, that squeeze and compress very simply through capillaries and through blood vessels, these ones have changed shape a little bit. So they look more like a half moon shape. Um, those half moon shapes are not going to fit okay, through the capillaries and create a lot of problems okay, for our patients. Okay, so here in this picture, you can see on this left-hand side, we've got a normal set of red blood cells. Um, as they encounter smaller spaces, they're going to simply compress and turn, um, and they'll be able to go through quite easily. However, in sickle cell, right, we've got some of these that are abnormally shaped, those nice little half moon shaped, okay, sort of cells. And you can see that as they approach um, forks in the blood vessels, or smaller blood vessels, they're going to become stuck because they don't have that ability to smush quite as much and get through. Um, therefore, they start to block the blood flow, which creates a lot of the pain and issues that we see with patients who have sickle cell anemia. Okay, so that is our most common genetic type of anemia, um, but the most common type that you will see inside of your facility is your iron deficiency. And if you go back to your picture, Remember that iron was one of the two major components okay, of um, hemoglobin, right? So if we don't take in iron through the diet, uh, certainly we cannot make the hemoglobin that sits in the red blood cells. All right, so when you come into class, just be prepared to tell me where some of those iron-containing foods are, okay? And so what is a good source of iron for our patients? All right, our next video will be on the white blood cells and the platelets.